when this farm was my grandparents, I wanted a, a dog to herd and bring in cattle. So I got a, a border collie and I found out that you can use goats for, for uh, training purposes. Uh, after years of using them and understanding them and getting some experience, that's something I started doing was raising Anatolians for other farms, homesteads. No matter the size, you can still use a livestock guardian. They're born and raised in the pasture the whole time. I allow, okay. the, I allow the females to dig a den. I had a couple in litters that had the, the hip problems, and that's something that's a problem in livestock dogs. And it's your responsibility to, to provide good stock. I try to do as much as I can to, to make sure that happens. It doesn't pass down to customers. But you still have to have them where they're manageable for the farmer. Uh, in case they need to go to a vet, or in case you need to move pasture, it was just more got involved. It's a challenge. It's still a challenge, and it, it, it always will be. You never will figure it out all the way. It's not a robot. You just stick it out there and you tell it, stay here, do this and do that. They're puppies, you know, even though they're 100 pounds, uh, they're puppies. When this farm was my grandparents. Okay. And my wife and I had been married about five years and we were wanting to uh, relocate. We was wanting to do something different. And my grandparents uh, were living here. That's what you see here is the last chicken house. Oh. They raised broilers. So this chicken house is, that back half is damaged from Katrina. And actually I've got material there to start re-roofing that. Okay, gotcha. But we just use it for storage. So that's what this was, is what this farm was originally with uh, beef cattle. Okay. So my grandpa, when you clean out chicken houses, you have chicken litter, and the chicken litter is spread in the pasture, so it, it helps produce uh, forage, grass, mm -hmm. and that's what the cattle was for, to, to control grass and use as a, another income. We were looking, my, you know, fast forward, my wife and I was looking for uh, another place, and we decided to start looking, and uh, my grandparents were uh, getting older, my grandpa, found out he had cancer and he was dealing with cancer. So I started helping mm -hmm. here more and got more interested in it, even though I grew up and come out and visited, but didn't really work the place that much. Got to talking with the grandpa and long, kind of fast forward again, we decided to purchase the farm. Used my grandparents for, for help and just to show us what they used, you know, what they've been doing with raising cattle and all. So that's kind of how we ended up here. Just a, a quick story. Well, the, the chicken houses were gone with Katrina, so we just continued with the uh, with the cattle. And okay. then I wanted to um, I wanted a, a dog to herd and bring in cattle, so I got a, a border collie. And I found out that you can use goats for for uh, training purposes. Well, that's where the goats came in. And at that time, I started researching goats and found out they need a guardian. And uh, that's that's how we became. Um, aware of, of the Anatolians. They were kind of new to the area, so I started. I had to research and find a few, and, and that's where I did try some other breeds that were cheap and free and learned some lessons with that route. And so that's kind of where I started out with some of my experience on what what to look for that you, you don't need. Like what? Roaming. The dogs didn't want to stay in the pasture with the livestock. They wanted to roam and get out, and they would dig and run off. Mm. Uh, some wasn't interested in staying with the livestock or even protecting. They just, uh, they didn't even, they just didn't do their job. They didn't care. Interesting. Uh, so we had to, uh, we had to learn that not all livestock dogs are working dogs. Just like any, any kind of livestock, you have, you have what we call culls. Right. Uh, so that's, it's just part of the nature. So yeah. it's almost like yes you have dogs and mm -hmm. primarily in at least the united states maybe elsewhere dogs are for pets right. but when you're working with livestock guardian dogs they really are like an added species of livestock they are yes ma'am that's you're, the way i their, like to look at it their product is protection that's not correct. necessarily something that you get but off of them with a lot of people they still look at the dog as pets you can still do the the pet and the the work it, but it's harder to for the dog to understand, especially in the the younger the puppy stage, what I call the puppy stage, and learning its job. It just makes it harder for the dog to to understand when and what to to do. There's a little learning curve there on um, on how to help the dog or the pup learn its job, 
but once you, it's called bonding. Once the dogs, it's bred into them, it's a natural instinct. Once the dogs are placed with livestock, whether it be goats, sheep, cattle, even, uh, even chickens, it's a little harder for chickens, poultry, birds, but uh, they, they naturally are, uh, are bred for sheep and goat. That's what they were intended for back you know, when the early, early days. But from what I under, from what my reading and understanding is, is, is that was their main job was for sheep and, and goat. So you got them because you wanted to herd your cattle. So okay. that, is that so that you didn't have to go chasing out in the field for them? Well, that or? was the border collies. That's why you had the collies. That's how okay. the border collie is a herding dog, which is a totally different breed. But that's where the goats, that's how the goats were established here. That's, that was one reason that I got the goats is because the goats uh, are foragers and they eat different uh, weeds and different things in the pasture that the cattle don't eat. Right. So they kind of help each other in the in the pasture so when I'm I'm out I do a rotational grazing with the cows but I'll, I'll allow the goats to go where they you know they like to roam and browse more so I, I allow them you can see this electric fence they're able to go under it okay and the cows can they stay behind the, the so fence. the the goats are more able to just kind of do what they want and you just trust their instincts to eat where mm -hmm. they feel like they need to eat versus the cattle is a little more controlled. Is that right? Well, that's the, that's just my management practice. Okay. Um, I like to do a more uh, intense grazing with the cattle because the cattle will do the same. They'll do selective grazing. And if you have a pasture that has better forage in some areas, they'll go to that more and it will never have time to recover. Right. So it, it allows the cattle to more or less graze that one section that we allow them to have and then I move on into a new section and they can't come back to this section that they were in. It allows it to cover and, uh, and regrow. It's, it's a part of a regenerative for pastures. Right. So that's kind of the management that I like to do. But the, the goats, they're still in a fenced in pasture, whether it's 15 acres, uh, some, one of them is a 40 acre field I like to use. So they have the whole run of that. Gotcha. And uh, that's just something that I st um, that I like to do. With and it them. works for you. Yes, ma'am. So awesome. in having big big area or even a smaller area um, with predators, and you have the goats in that area, they need protection. Right. So that's where the, the Anatolians come in. Okay. Or other breeds. You know, there's several breeds that people have options to use, but I choose the the Anatolians. And also, uh, after years of using them and understanding them and getting some experience. Um, that's something I started doing was raising Anatolians for other farms, homesteads. No matter the size, you can still use um, a livestock guardian, and that helps with uh, with your protection, whether it's a, a, just a couple animals or a big herd of animals. How is it that you are able to, well, look at that. I've never seen anybody use their hat to push it down. Well, the current can't flow through. Yeah. <laughs> it can possibly go through your boot. Uh, if you got a good, mm. if it's wet. Ah, that's a good point. So with the Anatolian shepherds, you're raising them for other people. How do you select what people need or how does, how does that work? Well, uh, that's another thing with my management. I like to keep my pups until they're five months old. During that five months, I'm watching them. I can tell their temperaments, just kind of see how they're growing. The main thing is, is making sure that they're going to work and be a, a livestock guardian. And I can just kind of see that. And it takes, it takes a good five months to, to watch, in my opinion, okay. because they're still young and puppies playing. Right. Do and, you have to watch them in a particular manner? What are you looking for? Uh, I really like to see, in, some, in most of the cases, they're around older dogs. So I like to see them with the, with the dogs working. I like, to, I like my dogs to stay close to the herd. Um, there's, a, there's a grandma, we we'll call her Del Delilah. Aww. She's, about, she's about 13 now, I think. Wow. But she was one of the first ones that I've raised from the originals that I bought. But everything here has basically come from, from her. And back to the puppies, I like to see in the, uh, the, the playing stage, I like to watch and see who's a little more standoffish or who's a little more dominant. 
certain things like that. And I also like to see if if they're out laying with the livestock during the day. You know, if, if they if they're in a pasture, they can choose wherever they want to go in that pasture because they're born and raised in the pasture the whole time. I allow okay. the I allow the females to dig a den or maybe they'll get in bushes or, or just wherever they choose. And okay. so the pups are born there and they're brought up in the pasture. Wow. And then once they get about three months, um, I'll move them around and start watching them a little bit. Okay. And that's when I really kind of see what they, uh, some of the things that they're doing. But it's still just a few things that you can see within that time frame. And these are just based on my experience. So you're gonna have right. so many different opinions, so many different uh, styles from others on how they do things. But with what I've been doing, uh, it's, it's been working. So, and I always, when I sell a pup to someone, I'm, I keep up with them and check on them, offer any kind of help or advice or anything. And What would you say is, I don't know what the right term is, but success rate for puppies out of maybe each litter? What, what percentage of puppies make it as a good life? Now that I've, I've been doing it a while, uh, just about a, 100%. Really? Uh, when, when you, and if you choose the right two two dogs, a male and female, to use to produce, that's when, you, if you have a good history and you understand their health, then you uh, then you have good rate, a good success rate. But in the early days, I had a couple in litters that had the, the hip problems. And that's something that's a problem in livestock dogs. They'll have a bad hips. And, uh, Is that and the I, hip dysplasia you're talking yes, about? Okay. And I narrowed it down to a female. And uh, so I, I didn't, I didn't have any pups out of her anymore, so I, I've been very careful with who I pick and choose as far as uh, what I call breeding stock in, in the dogs. So. What do you do with like that mom, or maybe it's not anymore, but the puppies that didn't make it, do you give them to friends and family or, or someone no, as pets? I don't, if they're, uh, like for, for her case, uh, she was still a good guardian. She still did her job. She was not able to produce good livestock, which some of the in that litter still still did good, still had good uh, good hips, but those genetics were there. And so those those pups, I feel, would still pass that on. So I notified them in case they were planning to breed with them. Back to the mom that had pups, she was fine, but I had her spayed to where she couldn't produce, and I still okay. used her as a, a livestock dog okay. until she, she became too old. And then she got pretty bad, and once once they get so old, uh, you have to make the decision, you know, to, to put them down. Yeah, because so, it's a welfare issue. You want to make sure they have high quality of life. Right, yes, yeah. ma'am. So you, you got to, that's a tough decision when, yeah. when to make that. But I want the customer to have to make those decisions. So as a, right. as a breeder, it's your responsibility to, to provide good stock and that's where I try to do as much as I can to, to make sure that happens and that it, it doesn't pass down to customers. I know that we can hear the dogs barking in the background, so I have a question about them too. Um, I think it's really interesting that you say that you let them litter, have their babies outside, mm -hmm. and that is extremely interesting to me. Why do you do it that way? Why don't you put them inside? I like to do things as close to natural as possible. The dogs, the way I feel that God developed them to have their own litters and mothering instinct the way he designed them to do. And that's one of the things that they do is uh, they, they know where to get and how to build a little den or a little shelter. If I don't have to go build a pen or build a shelter, and the dogs can do it, that's something less that I have to worry with. Yeah. So um, that's one thing that I try to do is just less maintenance. And that was one of the things that, that worked pretty good. Now over the years I have learned uh, with weather conditions, I've had some trouble with, uh, we have real heavy rains here. And when they dig their dens, it's usually in a bluff or in a low spot. And I've had some I've had some trouble with heavy rains. So I had I do learn to uh, I'm always you have to in farming you have to keep up with the weather to try to make future decisions. Mm -hmm. When the weather's coming and I have to do make a decision, I started using I uh, was able to pick up some of these used uh, little dog igloos and I'll put them in the woods to and so they're still really close to they're still in the pasture but you kind of kind of get in there and help them a little bit and give them a shelter and find another spot. But 
a lot of times that only lasts a couple of days and right. they, they want to move back to where they started. So they'll take all their puppies and go back to that original spot. So, I mean, it's definitely a management. You know who's pregnant, you know, yep. probably when she's going to mm -hmm. have babies or so, yeah, and you, or keep, you keep an eye on it. So it's like yep. the, maybe the happy medium between let them be feral yep. and I, I don't want to get too controversial, but like a puppy mill or something right, where it's funny. just rough conditions packed in tight yep. or maybe it's not so. Yep. We don't clean. have a, a building for puppy pens, you know, any of that kind of stuff. Now you mentioned feral. Um, once the pups are, their eyes open, they're getting out and about. I like to see who's, how many she's had and see if there's any trouble. Uh, so I start watching the den, pups start coming out. I start handling them a little bit because I've learned that you can let them go feral and they'll be wild. And they're, are they mean or they just don't want to do it? They don't want to be handled. They don't well, want they, the they job. They work very well, in my opinion, they're, they work better. But you still have to have them where they're manageable for the farmer. Yeah. In case they need to go to a vet or in case you need to move pastures. So I found there's a, a final medium where I like it on a certain amount of handling. Uh, it, it works for me, so I just do an occasional go in and check the pups. And while they're getting out and about, they can see me or my wife or, or my kids they, if they're out. Uh, like every couple days or so? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then once they get up around six weeks, we do a, uh, they do, they, the moms start weaning them on their own. I have feed stations set up. How old is that again? Around six weeks. Six weeks, okay. And the pups start learning to eat out of the feeder. And uh, the mom starts weaning them off seven, six, seven weeks, something like that. And uh, so you don't pull the puppies. No, ma'am. Everything's natural. Interesting. In their own time. And uh, now I do off. I do a, a vaccination. Okay. I do my own vaccination. So I, if I have seven, eight, ten pups, however many it is, I vaccinate them on a. Uh, once I realize they're they're weaned pretty good because they're still. If you, you need to wean them after they, I mean, vaccinate after they're weaned so they can start getting that vaccine working. They're not, it's not. It's not quite as effective when they're still on the mom. Yes, ma'am. So I do that and I, of course, uh, around four to five weeks, I start deworming them. So they get handled a little bit, you know, so I, I continue to deworm uh, on a schedule and then I do that vaccination. I don't know, around two, three months, um, I start getting them used to a lead rope. Okay. Where you got to train them to where they'll walk mm -hmm. on a lead, because if you uh, if you need to move them, take them to the vet or whatever. It's nice to be able to to lead them. Right. So that's one other thing that I do for them. For six or seven puppies. That's a little job. Yeah. Uh, How many moms do you usually have given birth at a time? Sometimes three. So it could be. Wow. It could. It's a little challenge. Yeah. You know, I'm not very big to where. I have too many, but uh, three litters is is a pretty good bit, uh, okay. and then that's for the year. Um, okay. Because every five to six months is when their the mom comes back in cycle, so that's okay. when uh, that's the way mine are doing. That's the schedule, and I I do plan breedings like with the parents, but I just allow them to to, to have pups on their schedule, so I don't pull one if she's in heat. Unless, unless there's a problem with uh, not having a male or a female, if they're related too close, that, that might be something you know, I might, I, I okay. might have to move them. I gotcha. But. So how many total dogs do you have on your farm then right now? 11 breeding dogs. Well, the, the grandma, she's, she's not a breeder anymore. She's retired. So she's the only one that's an adult that's not in production. Something okay. I started a few years ago was I noticed a need for uh, older dogs that are seasoned and ready to go straight to work and not have to deal with puppy stage, what okay. I call puppy stage. Is that newer farmers or maybe people who are newer to life Both and dogs? Both experienced, especially the experienced. They learn what, uh, they know what the puppy stage is, is about and they don't want to deal with it. <laughs> so, I've been there, done that, I'm okay. <laughs> so they would rather buy one that's already ready, drop it off and go to work. Yeah. Not have to deal with with uh, the puppy playness and just. Now I imagine that there's probably still some maintenance or pre-work, maybe I should call it, that that new owner would have to do to get the dog used to them. Is that right? A little bit, not much. It usually takes 
a couple weeks for the dog to uh, get adjusted to the livestock because when the dog leaves here, the bonds broke from the, the livestock that it's with. Okay. So it takes a couple a couple weeks is what I always try to say on um, on getting the bond with the new livestock. What does that look like? Uh, it's basically the livestock getting used to the dog, being a new dog, and then the okay. dog, if it's an older dog, it's pretty quick. It's within a few days because they know what to do. They, okay. they know yeah. what to, what they've been around. So it's it's pretty quick on an, an older dog that's mature and ready. With And when I say that, that's uh, two years and older. The uh, A pup, say it leaves here at five or six months, I always try to give a good 30 or 40 day window to allow the pup to get adjusted. Usually it's pretty quick, but I always try to err on the, the longer side, for mm -hmm. the, you know, just letting the customer know what to expect. Now you have a lot going on and I think that it adds to your credibility that you have livestock and maybe you started as a livestock farmer and then got into having the dogs and raising the dogs. Do you find that that's a major benefit for you? Or do you think that if someone wanted to raise livestock guardian dogs that maybe they didn't need to have that background? Really the the livestock dogs, they don't need a lot from from the farmer, from the owner, because they they pretty much know what they're doing as far as their job. They only they're not really having to be taught. The only thing is you have to do is you have to know what I call teaching them manners, and that's some of the things that comes with experience. But uh, as far as um, my my opinion is, if if you're gonna raise and sell, you should be able to give support to the customers. So you should have experience on different things that could come up. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that quite answered that, but I would think you would need to, to be able to, you would need to own the dogs for a few years and get to learn yeah. and uh, be able to know what to look for. Right. But there's a lot of people there that are doing it. Do you, do you find that the market's saturated then? It's or? getting there, yes ma'am. Really? Yep. Why is that? Uh, money. They know they can make a bunch of money doing they it. Wanna, they want to, a lot of them want to recoup. They think because they bought a dog, they want to get their money back, but they don't realize they're getting their money back when their livestock's protected. Yeah, that's and a good point. They, and then they see, well, I can raise, raise pups and do the same thing. And they can. But then if you are not, if you're not able to see problems if you're not able to give support in my opinion that's that's not as good as getting support from a breeder that has experience mm -hmm. and but that's just all in it i guess um do you think that that's just the way business runs sometimes or do you think that that's ultimately hurting the market both that's how the dogs are are making it this this long is people are continuing to breed and raise mm -hmm. you know so that's what's keeping it going but in the same same point, they will uh, they will saturate the market. You yeah. know, everybody's wanting to do it, and then you start getting uh, those that that are having trouble selling them, mm. and then they they have a a big litter, and they need to do something with them, and mm. they need to move them, so they start undercutting, and they they sell them for a little bit of nothing, and then you got people that are looking, and they of course always trying to cut cost, and they buy the cheaper one. And then that could be could be a negative to where you don't get the support and you don't you're not getting the quality animal. So that's just some chances that they're taking. How would people as a consumer do better about doing like how how do you check your resources on that? Of course, I always like to say reviews from customers if you can talk to the breeder and ask for uh, customers. Oh, so you can't ask for references. Mm -hmm. that's... Yeah, that's always the best policy. And then just talk to the people, to the breeder, you know, call them up and talk to them, come to the farm and visit. That's that's the best thing, if, if possible. But I get a lot of people that I ship to, so they're not able to actually come here. But I can send videos and show them parents, uh, talk, talk to them on the phone, mm -hmm. answer questions. And, um, the more open, the mm -hmm. better. Yeah, that's the way I, I like to do business. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You didn't grow up farming. <laughs> How did you get into this? 
my grandparents were getting older and I knew they were, you know, getting where they wanted to kind of retire. So that's where, it, that's where the interest started with just helping out. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once I got out here, uh, just kind of started experimenting with stuff. Kind of like with the, with the goats, you know. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize the goats cleaned up as good as they did. A little spot back there, when I went and got a couple of goats from the stockyard, I didn't really have good fencing, so I used a collar and a cable and a block. Yeah. And I just I just kept my goats back there, and I got to realizing what the goat was doing. It was eating briars and mm -hmm. just cleaning up really well. So that's kind of how we got interested in uh, in the goats. And mm -hmm. then we found some books. That's where a lot of the information come from with books, learning, trying to figure things out. And then uh, that's where we realized the the Kiko breed was a more fit for our climate because we're hot, humid, mm -hmm. a lot of rain. And uh, so that's where we started with the, with that breed. Gotcha. So it all started from one border collie that I wanted to, I wanted that border collie to gather up calves because that's all we had was a kettle. And uh, so that's where, that's where the goat started and then the Anatolian. Interesting. But back to your question about, uh, are you in, about the background, it was just, more got involved it's a challenge it's still a challenge and it, it, it always will be you never will figure it out all the way because you know you have weather e each year's different the market and uh, just trying to manage everything and i guess that's a good point because you sell the meat products yes, off of your cattle and your goats mm -hmm. we do we sell uh we have we sell meat and we sell uh, replacements for breeding stock for other okay. farms. Sometimes I can do a package deal to where, like maybe a few goats and a dog, something like that. Okay. I tried selling uh, beef, uh, grass-fed beef. I do that a little bit. That's still new, uh, so I'll keep a few and uh, raise here for customers. And I, what I do is just they, I keep them in the same rotation as the rest of the cattle and, and uh, until they get. Uh, ready for processing and so that's that's another learning curve that that's been uh, an experiment what do you do otherwise if they're not going for processing you just go they, to the stockyard the stockyard yes ma'am okay. let buyers buy there so you're you're basically taking what they'll give you now are you full-time on the farm or do you have an off-farm job as well off the farm i wish it was full-time um, but I'm kind of in the middle, of my, in my opinion, of being big enough for supply, supporting the family. It's mm -hmm. a family of four. Of course, my my two are getting older, so they're they're uh, just a few more years. They'll probably moved out, so it'll be just my wife and I. But mm -hmm. um, so I work uh, in smaller uh, town, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, uh -huh. and I work in a, a chemical plant as a instrumentation electrical so i do i do have to uh rely on that to help with the support gotcha but this year what we first we paid off the farm this year so congratulations we, we've been waiting on that so that is so exciting it'll be a little easier to support itself that was my goal was have the farm support itself yeah mainly and then hopefully be able to support a few things that i want to do that my wife and i want to do so I look at it as maybe a retirement now, just to be able to maintain itself and then supply a uh, retirement life. Yeah. You know, because I, I like to work it. I still like handling things. Yeah. You, you now, have those bad days right. and good days. But He's got some that. teeth action going on. Are you trying to be scary? Yeah, his, uh, his grandpa was that way. He really? would just smile. Oh, he's smiling. smiling? Yeah. It's, it looks like he's growling It kind of looks a little scary. But he's happy. Are you happy? Oh, your tail's wagging. Your ears are good. Yeah. Oh my, that's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy to see you. So his grandpa was a good dog? He was. He yeah. actually, we have a uh, local uh, school. and uh, Matter of fact, it's the only agriculture high school in the state. Ag What's an agricultural high school? Uh, that's what it's based on is, is uh, they raise livestock there. And uh, they've got a long history with it. Um, <laughs> And they have an agricultural class where they they teach the kids to raise livestock. They they uh, they have cattle and uh, a few sheep and goat, and I think they have a horse, a couple of horses. But uh, that's what they do. They they bring the kids in. They have uh, they have class. Teach them how to do pregnancy testing, give vaccines. They, I haven't been through it, but uh, I've talked with the the lady that's over it, and uh, that's. 
that's how I got involved with it. They needed a livestock guardian. That's and, really cool. So they've got a, a guardian and a, a goat uh -huh. uh, breeding. We call them, the males are bucks, so they got a breeding buck to put in their uh, program. That's really cool. So, so how old are his dad went for okay. getting out. Oh, the, so I his mean, dad his is his on grandpa. The, his grandpa so. is on that agricultural high school. Yeah. Still? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. really cool. So and they how, had a good year oh. this past year with him. They said they didn't have any losses or anything. And how cool is it for kids to see kind of like we were talking about earlier, the difference between a pet and a livestock, you know, like a a farm animal. Well, see, as as the dog. You can see how they're acting. They're really not a whole lot of difference than a yard dog on mm -hmm. how they come up and wag. And we'll go see some older ones, but so they really don't, it's hard to tell unless you just know what the dog is doing. You know, a lot of people don't, they don't understand when they come riding through a field and they see dogs out in the field, uh, they really don't understand what's going on, a lot of people. What do you mean by that? Have you had people stop and ask you or something? I've had some questions, yes ma'am, but most of the time you see dogs running loose in your yard. Uh, you know, as a, what I call yard dogs, uh -huh. and they don't, they're not used to seeing them out in the pasture. And these are always in the pasture and they're always out in the livestock. Sometimes if you have, uh, if you have a big enough group, especially in the evening or in the early morning, you won't even hardly see them. They'll be laying in the middle uh -huh. you know, or close to the edge and they kind of blend in with them. So how old are these guys here? Uh, they're just about five months old. So they're- They're about ready they're about to find ready. a new home? This, yes ma'am. I've and got a few people interested. Um, use it. Sometimes I have waiting lists, and then sometimes um, when they get about this age, I start advertising. I use social media. Uh, the state has a market bulletin. I use that, and just a little different places. Been mm -hmm. trying to market them. Interesting. You hear the dogs in the distance? Yeah, I saw them running across. So it sat. It looked like they were all you had an attention. Yep. Yeah, tail. What we're there. having? This is the last weekend of deer season with dogs. Dog hunting. Oh. So you might get to experience something. I don't know, hopefully we won't, but. So this is interesting. I see four dogs out here with your goats. This is, uh, this what I do is I'll hold uh, my kid crop until they're a year old. Okay. So this is the bucklings from the kid crop. Okay. And uh, I got, I got a few dogs with these goats. Why do you have so many dogs with them? I usually just see people with one goat for their whole, or one dog for their whole herd. Yes, ma'am, that's normal. Okay. It goes back to me being a producer of dogs. I see, I see. Hi. Well, look at you. So these, this is a... Uh, Hi, buddy. Do you need to smell me first? I'm safe, I promise. Yeah, everybody will be friendly. All okay. The, all the, we're used to, uh, that's Hi, another buddy. thing, is having them to where people have visitors and still be safe. This one and this one is a pair, okay. a young pair. A mom pair. and daddy. These two are pups that I'm watching Okay. that, that will be available. Now, so. I heard a dog, so you said that people around here hunt deer with their dogs. Yes, ma'am. This is the woods all the way through there. That's the uh, national, the Southern National Forest. Oh, okay. And the, the hill, we can see it when we go in the field there, the um, uh, Camp Shelby. Okay. It's a uh, military training ground, mm -hmm. you know, it's a base, and that's the edge of it. So this is the bombing area and uh, uh -huh. training site. So it gets pretty loud, we have to deal with that. But. Okay, now if you have, and I know that this can sometimes be a controversial subject, so you don't have to say too deep if you don't feel comfortable, but with dogs coming over here and your dog's attacking them, how does that work with liability and like property rights? I know that there's like some, some hard feelings around there about that. How yes, do you handle that? I just try to work with the hunters as much as possible. They have my phone number. Um, so it's not just like strangers coming around for the most part, you, some you know. Is, some of them, yes, okay. but the word, word gets out. Uh, so the, the most of the hunters understand what they're doing right in here because of the fencing. The hunting dogs are, sometimes are able, they do come in and they don't make it out all the time. Uh, so I try to work with them and um, if they, they have the tracking collars, they know where their dogs are at. So if they feel like, if they see that it's getting pretty close and one's in the field, I try to get in. And, and sometimes I'm able to get them. Sometimes I'm able to, to uh, bring them out and 
It just kind of depends on how soon I'm able to get there. Like if you're at work. Oh uh, yes, well that and... happens, you know. So we do have problem. We do have. They do have death. That's just. Just kind of life. A lot of a lot of the hunters understand that that risk, and they're they're still taking it. So you say a lot of the hunters understand that. So you're saying that they know the risks when they go out with their dogs, that their dog could be hurt because they're going. They, it could go onto someone else's property. Yes, ma'am. Interesting. They've all been respectful, you know, as far as uh, trying to keep their dogs away. They mm -hmm. use the the tracking system where they have remotes and yeah. uh, keep their dog. You know, try to keep them from coming too close to the fence. Uh, now the some of the Hunters are getting on the uh, the fence line, and they're keeping the dogs pushed away to help keep the dogs from getting in. So okay. they're doing that. Well, that's nice. I I think all too often in media we see the worst of the worst stories yeah. from both sides, and it's nice to hear the casual. We work together. We're all in this together, and we just try to make sure that we're doing our part so that nobody gets hurt. Right. The deer, the deer dogs, they're not a problem. They're not a predator. They're, uh, they're running the deer. Uh, they just happen to run across the wrong field. So with the experience that I have with neighbors, letting their, you know, we talked about yard dogs earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes that has, that has trouble. Yard dogs come into the fence? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And a lot of my customers have, uh, they have predators from yard dogs. That's something that I have to uh, make them aware of that and of course that's the reason why they need the the guard dogs right to protect their animals so mm -hmm. they're okay with that and they they talk with the neighbors and, and tell them say look this is what what i've got here and this could happen if yeah. you if you continue to let your dogs run loose that's that's one of the things that you have to deal with yeah with uh having livestock dogs you know the saying good fencing keeps happy neighbors I'll show you the uh, feed station that I was telling you how the dogs, you know, they, they feed, they eat in yeah. the field. I have them stationed in different pastures, so it cuts down on me having to feed every day. Ah. Oh, is that these? Yes, ma'am. Oh, nice. You just repurposed the cages for IBC totes. That's it. That's the outside. And that's a four foot gate. Yeah. And then do they just lift that lip up with their nose? It's a, uh, it actually just, it's a, got, it's weatherproof, so they just. Oh, they just push it. Yes, ma'am. Nice. And then you can fill from the top. Okay. It takes, it'll hold one bag. You get different sizes, but these are 50 pound feeders. It's pretty, pretty waterproof. You really don't have to worry about the weather with it, with the doors being closed. Yeah. So, so how often, I guess that's kind of a question you don't, I didn't think about is how often do they eat? Do you feed, so well, this, they just eat like on demand? This setup, they, they eat when they need to. When they're they hungry. They just eat a little. They don't, you know, I guess the most, most of the time people feed by a once a day, uh -huh. twice a day, and they'll feed a bowl full or something. This, they eat just a handful, this method here. Interesting, and that probably keeps their weight down. Yep. Well. And active. It just, it maintains. I don't have anybody with uh, over overweight or underweight. You yeah. Know, they're able to maintain do they body. fight over the feed much or they just kind of know their pecking order pretty much the pecking order okay and you can see i have multiple yeah so i have a choice to where they're not all just getting in one with uh with the fields that i have just one and if there's multiple dogs they they have a pecking order okay and another thing is it's by allowing them to feed like this they don't get all in eat like it. that <laughs> they don't all eat at once so they're not fighting over feed oh they yeah know they can come and go can they so that's how they get in? That's it. Okay, I was thinking you open the gate, but no, they just squeeze through. The purpose of the the gate is to have that width bar to keep the goats out. Ah, that it's makes sense. It's not 100% goat proof, but it keeps most of them out. That's awesome. There is one negative there. What's that? If you got a if you got gates that has the same setup, the dogs can slip through it. Oh. So you have to make sure your gates are, are a different style. That's the I only see. negative that I've found with that so far. <laughs> That's an oopsie. <laughs> you find that one out the hard way, but huh? I, I have tried uh, I have tried different methods that you see online where people are setting up feed stations and stuff. Uh -huh. and, and I just couldn't get anything to work just right. Huh. And the dogs really don't want to leave the pasture. 
they stay with the goats so i don't have a problem with them trying to get out it's just if i separate like this field and these two fields are only separated with that one gate uh, i don't want the dogs fighting and getting, yeah you know trying to get in yeah i don't say we can find the other older ones this is really pretty down here yes. has it always been pasture did you have to clear out any of it it's always my mom and then when uh, when they established, they, they cleared, cleared this. Gotcha. That's the national forest right through there. That line. You see them laying over there by the wood line? That's two dogs. There. Okay, okay. So that's yep. what it looks like if you just slip up on them. You know, they're kind of just. They do kind of just blend in. They're just kind of lounging around, staying with the herd as they move around. Yeah. And that's just an inherent instinct for them, right? Yes, ma'am. You don't really have to teach them that. That's what I want though, but some of them won't do that. You know, that's what I was talking about earlier with dogs that I've had in the beginning. Mm -hmm. They just didn't work out. And then you've got some of your, is it, are these feeder cattle? That's some of the calves, yes ma'am, that I kept yeah. just to see how they were going, if they were going to grow out. Some of the heifers were a replacement. Gotcha. Let's see if they're coming right here, so maybe they'll come up. <laughs> see one's coming, looks like. Two? Yeah, they are. Yeah, they both got up. They're leery to see what we're doing. <laughs> Tail wagging, though. Let's see if I can get them to come. Come on. Nobody has a name that they know. They, okay. they have names for records. Okay. I just whistle for them. Or usually they'll, they'll see me coming and they'll come check us out. So I really don't, I don't have any, I don't really call a name. Do you advise that the farmers that you sell them to has it, gives them a name that they know? I just, that's their option. They, okay. Most of them do. You know, if you call, call them by their name enough, they'll learn. But the pups, they're all used to a whistle. Uh, so. How do you identify? Do you do like any tattoo marking or anything like that? Or you just uh, no, know their coloring? Just know. Yeah. And, uh, and I keep a record of who they are, uh, like. If I have a female in heat, I'll write her name down. And if she had pups, I'll write her name down with uh -huh. the male. This is Hi. the old male that I have. How he's old the son are you? <laughs> of, of the old uh, female up front. Okay. So oh. He's okay. been he's been around for a while. He's kind of the main breeder that I'm using. Gotcha. He looks good. And that the male in that other field is is the next one. He's a kind of taking over. I try not to keep too many too many males to prevent from fighting. Hello. <laughs> you are big. You want some pets. Go on. I don't know if I'm supposed to pet you. It's fine, but some people, they don't like to. I don't mind. We have two oh, huge don't? dogs, so okay. I don't mind. I just, I He's know working dogs. <laughs> I don't want to bother working dogs. Am I allowed to pet you? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll give you a good pet. You're a good dog. Yes, you are. Are you smiling? All right. I'll let you get back to work. Thank you. But that's that's <laughs> what they do. They, uh, they pretty much... Uh, they live like livestock. They're, they stay with uh, whatever you put them with. Most of the customers are putting them with uh, with sheep and goat. That's, yeah. That's where most of them are. Yeah. It's How... harder to uh, it's harder to put them with chickens. That's what I was gonna birds. ask. Uh, Why is that? I don't know. Um, there's probably some more educated people that could answer that. As far as uh, you see them, you oh, see a you. lot of people with. Uh, with livestock dogs with their chickens, uh, even pastured chickens, you, you need them more or just as much with uh, with the chickens. Right. The thing is, is they, uh, when they're puppies, they like to play yeah. and you just have to manage them. You have to teach them not to be too rough. Chickens are not as durable as goats and sheep. You know, they, they, they can't handle the, the Is it chewing. true that when they get the taste of blood, then they want it? Uh, I'm not, it seems like it, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't really done a lot with chickens uh, as far as raising them with chickens. I've helped customers. We've had ideas. We've tried different things, and, and they've worked. But Like what? Do you have an example, maybe? Uh, mainly for the pasture chickens, uh, if you are able to put a uh, put the pup in the middle of the pasture, around the, let the chickens be around them, maybe, say, use the chain-link fence, the chain-link pins or electric fence, the netting that you see. You can make a, a area for the dog to stay in until you're able to manage. And once you're able to go out and manage, you, you allow the dog to come out and you walk them around mm. and you give them time. 
And when you see that they're wanting to get rough and play, that's when you correct them. And give them instruction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So you just have to, and I tell the customers, you got until about two years before you have to, you can trust them. Yeah. Um, they, they, some of them, like I was saying earlier, I try to uh, breed for early mature, and some of them mature earlier. Uh, you know, around 15 months, 16 months, and he was he was early. Uh, mm -hmm. He didn't have that playful and wanting to. He was more serious and calm, easy going. So I'm hoping that uh, that his offspring will be the same, and I can start concentrating more on that without losing any of the other instincts. You know, from a guardian, right? And still do their work. You see how that one's laying there. Just kind of watching over yeah. the place. This one right in front of you, Tilly there, she, that's what they do. They, if you was to just kind of sit back and watch, that's how they work. And just kind they of come keep an up, eye on you, the line. you notice how they checked us out? Uh huh. And then they kind of get, get back and just kind of, I don't want a lot of tension from them. Yeah. Uh, I want them to do what they did, come up to us, allow me to check them over, look for any problems or anything, and then kind of go back I don't so it's wanna... not like you come out here with like your big baby voice and you're like oh good yeah. boy and they like give them rubs <laughs> some and do stuff. Now. these are these are just my experience and my okay. management style yeah some people do different things uh, and that's fine is that more of a personality thing you think or <coughs> is that more of a management style because some uh, people are both. aren't like pet people more yeah. than others you know yeah. uh probably probably a little bit of both uh i feel like on the management side if they're handled too much, they want to come to the house for too much, a lot of attention. In my experience, I feel like they, they're not as, they, they're not working as, as much as you would think because they like, they're, they're dogs. They like the attention. Yeah. You know, they, they want the, the loving and petting from you. But you need them to be able to just do that. That's Go right. sit underneath a shade tree and, and a, hang a lot out. of customers or just sit here and. A lot of customers come to me because their dogs are on the porch and not out there where they're supposed to be. And there again, these are my experiences and the way I, I've done to work to work them. And uh, this is what I tell them, you know. The very first, uh, I always say the very first 30 days of getting a pup home is critical to get the pup bonded to your livestock. And um, Maybe not bonded to you. To you. Mm, and I tell them sense. to try to do minimum as you can as far as petting and because you want them to bond with your livestock that's the purpose of buying my pup is to protect those and that's where he needs to be yeah absolutely you've got a lot going on here and you've talked about how you manage it how you've kind of come into this and a little bit about what your future is like but if you, there's anybody out there who is looking for a good livestock guardian dog what would be like your first piece of recommendation for them? Basically, visit the farm that's that's offering it, if possible. If not, uh, call them up and ask questions. Ask them how long they've been doing it. Ask them uh, how long have they had their dogs and how do they manage their dogs. And you want to see if if you already have ideas of what you're looking for in a dog. You want to see if they're managing theirs the same way or close gotcha. such as so it could take some time probably to like find the right place the yeah. right dog mm -hmm. yep because there's there's a, a lot of people raising them and uh so you just have to kind of get a background on them and try to find out if if it's something that fits your need uh, because there's different breeds so it's not just not just someone raising the dogs it's, they have different breeds right northern climates have uh of course, a lot colder weather, so you, you might be looking for a dog with a, a thicker coat. Even though the Anatolians can go either way, uh, some people might might want the, the thicker, uh, more the Karakachan, and some of the mother, a couple other breeds are real thicker. Even the Pyrenees, the Great Pyrenees, mm -hmm. a little more thicker and fluffier. Um, and the Anatolians, they uh, they can manage the cold and the, the heat. That's one of the things that I liked about them, their, their hair. You saw how they're kind of a mm -hmm. slick hair. Uh, and uh, I like the Anatolian's temperament, how they they seemed to stay with the livestock more. They didn't want to roam as much. Uh, they didn't want to bark as... Some of the customers would tell me, with the Pyrenees being one example, that they would bark a lot at certain things, even though it wasn't a predator. They, mm -hmm. they just a constant bark and a constant roam. But uh, not all Pyrenees are like that. So 
it just depends on the uh, the breeder that has the livestock just see how uh, see how they're doing with theirs see if they offer a uh, a guarantee on their dogs you know as far as health are working because uh, that's important you don't want to pay the money and, and get something that you can't use right yeah what about on the other side of that if there's somebody out there that wants to get into raising livestock guardian dogs what would be your advice on that side given the saturated market that there is right now start out make sure first of all make sure the the dogs that are you using or have the good genetics uh, make sure you can get some history on them be ready for uh, the market as far as being able to to move them and uh, advertise and be willing to to um, help customers and it's not just about the dog it's really about the job that they're trying to do right, that is what yep, you're yeah. raising you, it's, it's important because a lot of customers that I get they are new they, they just get they just want to start a farm and they, they want livestock and then they realize they need protection and then that's a whole new experience with a, with a with a dog most people all they know of dogs is, is maybe a yard dog you know and they they don't really have any other experience so they need the uh, they need the help uh, they need advice and uh, they just need your support as a breeder with experience to help them get the the livestock dog to do its job mm -hmm. you know and make it through those puppy stages because it's difficult uh, I feel like a lot of good dogs uh, lose their life early being a puppy not doing what the owner thought you know it's not a robot you just stick it out there and you tell it stay here do this and do that they're puppies you know even though they're 100 pounds uh they're puppies yeah and, and they're gonna do what puppies do and i call it the teenage months to where they get rough and um, maybe defiant <laughs> listen and it's just part of it. they get bored they yeah. want stuff to do they've been out there playing around they still they still like to be with livestock they're they're just puppies yeah so you got to be able to have that support for that right that seems very important when, mm -hmm. again, it's protecting your pretty valuable assets. Mm -hmm. So you want to that's, that's you want to make sure you do it right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So my last question is: We've talked a little bit about how there are like different kinds of people, um, people who like maybe aren't pet people as much, mm -hmm. and you don't really like baby your dogs and mm -hmm. like kind of treat them like pets. Am I gonna find out that you have a Chihuahua in your house? That you like love on like a little baby <laughs> well that's, that's, do you have a yard dog <laughs> my my daughter has a uh, miniature schnauzer oh i called it <laughs> uh, he likes to sit with me in my chair <laughs> i love it i knew so, it yeah. yeah that's my little buddy that's awesome <laughs> oh man well yeah. Thank but you. everybody likes dogs, right? Everybody it's really some does. sort. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't really a dog person until I met my husband, mm -hmm. and he came with a dog, a Collie Aussie, oh. that he rescued from a pound at eight weeks. Oh, really? Mm hmm And so Hunter was three when we got together, and I never really was like, like we had outside dogs on mm -hmm. the farm that just like did their thing. They weren't working dogs. Right, they just yeah. like did their own thing outside. And... Um, I got into Hunter and we'd lay together on the couch and take naps together. There's one dog out there that will just bring you yeah. onto the pet side. <laughs> Is that why they call it man's best friend? Probably. <laughs> There's one. Yeah. There's only one. Yeah. Well, thank you, Shane, so, oh, so much welcome. for having me out. I've learned so much from you and I know others will. Anything that you have described, resources, um, your website, anything like that, any links that we can provide will be in the description below. Mm -hmm. um, and if anybody has any questions, they can reach out to you sure. through that. No, um, I don't mind text or messages or anything. Sweet. Okay. Well, thank you so much again. I really, really appreciate it. I've had so much fun. And maybe we can come back one day and see how you've grown a little bit more. Sure. <laughs>